If you'll stand again with me. Uh, I appreciate everyone being sensitive to God. I, I always pray this way, but especially this morning, I pray that God would set the table, prepare your hearts for what He wants to say. And uh, our scripture reading was that, that psalm that's precious to so many of us because it talks about our shepherd and how intimate we can be with him. And then we heard songs like, In the presence of the Lord, and God set a fire down in my soul. And then in the last song, there was a phrase that said, Longing just to see his face. Which reassured me that, I, uh, this, that I'm going to share with you. I have prepared for a minister's conference that my wife and I uh, will be at this week. And I thought it was for that, but God prompted me to share this with you. I'll probably share it with them too in a different form, but uh, everything that's been said, including Dennis's illustrations, fit this whole topic of face-to-face. -face. Did you say face-to-face? -face? There's nothing like being face-to-face -face with someone, and there's nothing like being right there in a place. My uh, father-in-law took a trip to Israel 20-some years ago, and it was an exciting thing for him. They'd never been to Israel before, and so he called the church on Sunday morning while we were in service, and we put him on speakerphone, and he happened to be at that time in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was trying to talk about being right there and how the guide had just told them that since olive trees live for so long, some of the olive trees they might have been standing under were the same ones Jesus knelt and prayed under. And as he was trying to tell us what he was experiencing, uh, he was sobbing because it was, it was it's nothing like just being right there, feeling that whole thing. I remember when my wife and I were able to go to Rome uh, for our 20th wedding anniversary, we were visiting the Colosseum, and the, we only got to spend a few hours there in Rome that day, but as we walked down the hill from the, the tour bus and into the Colosseum, it was, it was just surreal. But what I remember about it was as we walked through the Colosseum, wandered around, it was, as most of you have seen pictures of, it's half fallen down, uh, but you could look down into these cubicles and it, it, was just, it was just irreplaceable to, to be there and look down where Christians had been held before they were released to the lions. To look down where gladiators waited to go out and do their stuff. Just being there. Just experiencing it. it you, I've seen pictures of it. I knew it, I'd, I'd read about it, I'd taken tests about it in school, but to actually be there. It's one thing to know about something, it's, it's something else to know it personally. It takes a lot of effort to get to the Colosseum, to get to the Holy Land, to get to these unusual places. And the same is true in the spirit realm. We have an opportunity we have an invitation, and it's, uh, it's shown in Psalm 27 when the psalmist is sharing an experience. Verses 7 through 9, it says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. That is a picture of the guy who had, the Bible says, a, a heart after God's. He was a man after God's own heart. Why? He was a mess up. He was a guy who did some horrible stuff, but somehow when God said, seek my face, this imperfect human being who messed up, who had to repent many times, he sought God with everything that is with him. I feel like God would offer you, remind you, woo you again, would you seek my face? Now as the illustration was just given, you know, if someone walked into this room today 
and they were trying to sell tickets to the Red Sox game, I wouldn't give them a second thought. I, I, I'm not trying to offend people. I, you, you all know that about me. I, they could offer me box seats for $50, and I probably wouldn't take them up on it. Because I'm, it just doesn't interest me. Now, if they were off, offering uh, a cabin on a cruise liner going to the Mediterranean to see Athens and the Holy Land, well, I'd, I'd pay pretty good money for that. Because I'm interested in that. I don't know if you're interested in this or not. There may be some people in this room who are only interested in saving their hide and not going to hell. But I think there's some people in this room who are interested in a face-to-face with God. You're not just interested in not going to hell. You're interested in going to be with Him. You're interested in a relationship with Him. I may be... Uh, it may be as futile today for me to stand here in front of some of you and talk you into this as it would be for someone to come and talk me into buying a Red Sox ticket. But I'm going to try. Would you pray for God to help me? Lord, I pray that you would help us today to be able to feel this from you, Lord. That this would not be just my words. It would not just be one human appealing to another human, but that you would anoint everything that is said and that you would allow the wooing of your presence to be here, God. That you would help every one of us to, to hunger after this, to desire this, to taste it, to want it, Lord. That you would help us to be able to respond to this. That we would not be distracted. That we would not let apathy and lethargy steal this relationship that you've offered us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may have heard of God. You may have actually felt His presence like was sung about today. But here's the question I have because I don't know that I could say yes to this question. It's a question that I thought about a lot since God brought it up a few months ago. Have you ever looked into His eyes? Have you ever looked into God's eyes? Do you ever feel like you've had a prayer time where you were face to face with God? Have you ever been so overwhelmed with the holiness of God that you you didn't even know if you could look up? It's like you, you knew that God was right there in your face. Some of you probably have, at least felt you have, but I feel like God is here today to say to you, everybody would with, with doesn't matter what kind of experience you've had. There are face-to-face, eye-to-eye experiences with me that you have not yet tasted of. You've never been there. You saw the picture. You saw it from afar. You saw the movie. But you never stood there and felt the vibes. You never felt the voices of those who were there before. You've never stood in the Colosseum and really felt the spirit of that place. You just read about it. You just learned about it. You just heard a sermon about it. It's rare, but it's very possible, evidently, to look into His eyes. Now, there's no God like our God. Uh, let, let, Let me just remind you of this for just a minute. I'm not being mean or bigoted, it, it's just that there is no God but our God. He is the only God. I, I, I'm sorry I can't adjust the Bible. I would have to twist the Bible to something that couldn't even be recognized anymore if I were to buy into the world philosophy that there are many ways to heaven and there are many gods. You have your God and I have my God. There are many higher powers and whoever you choose to be your higher power is up to you. That's hogwash. That's lies. That's ignorant. That's imbecilic. Can I be stronger than that? That's just the way I feel. I I don't think you can buy into that. I, I don't hate other people who have other gods. I just serve the God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. There's only one. He looks to his right and his left, and there's no other. Now, if, if you don't believe the Bible, then have at it. Go serve your God somewhere. But my Bible says there's only one God. When we look at other gods, if you were to look, for example, at Hindu gods, 
the, the Hindu is a, uh, Hinduism is pantheistic, meaning they say there's one God, but then again they say God is in everything. So everything is a God, and there's, there's millions of gods. And so there are lists and lists and lists of gods. And you can do a simple search, for example, on YouTube on things like Hinduism. Uh, and, and there's a very interesting search if you put in Hinduism and piercing. Because you'll see some of the rituals of some of the Hindu uh, festivals in which... Uh, the body piercing that our culture has borrowed from. We only pierce our noses and our ears, but, but that came from false religions. And, and when, it, when it gets done, it doesn't stop with your nose and your ears, but there are meat hooks that are in these men's backs, and they'll pull vehicles with them. They're, they'll have 40 and 50 big old fish hooks in them with apples hanging on and oranges hanging on and they'll be squealing and jumping and doing all these weird stuff that are very clearly satanic because they're open to many gods. And, and devils love that. Nothing like our God. God's never going to make you go crazy and, and scream with horror and, and poke your body and, and jab uh, steel poles through your cheeks and, and cause you to stick things under your skin and paint things on your body. That's not our God. Our God doesn't do that. I'm not, I'm not trying to be self-righteous. I'm just saying God created you as a human being and He doesn't want you to mutilate your body. He doesn't want you to medicate your body with, with drugs that make you do weird stuff. He, he wants you to be who He called you to be and have the abundant life that He invented for you. But gods like the Hindu gods cause them to do face crucifixions and to walk on glass and to, to do all kinds of weird stuff. Gods like the god that the, the Muslims worship ask them to put bombs on themselves and blow themselves into smithereens. That's the only way their god says that they're going to please him. Gods like Brother Filkins told us about, he was a missionary to the Ivory Coast, and he, he told us about being in the village where there were witch doctors who were asking mothers to bring their children to them, and they would throw these children, these babies, and I'm just talking a few years ago, over the cliff, and they would watch alligators eat them alive. That's not the real God. Those are inventions. Those are those are things that the enemy has inspired people to believe in. Those are vicious, ugly gods. Even, even the American Indians, if you are fair about studying them, much of their religion was inspired by drugs and hallucinogenic experiences. It, it, you go fast for many days and take drugs and you'll see visions. Well, anybody, that'll, that'll happen, you know, when you get have an operation, you know. Th that kind of stuff. That's not what a, a God's about. That's not what reality is about. I had the opportunity again to experience this a few years ago. And I've shared it before with, with many of you, but uh, we went to Guatemala. And in Guatemala, we took a side tour while we were on this mission trip. And we came to some Mayan ruins. And to stand there again, it was like standing at the Colosseum. It's like I, I could see these ruins and imagine these, these Mayan Indians who live there and uh, imagine people running around their little community there. And, and then uh, as we walked around those ruins, we saw off to the side some smoke and around this fire were some Mayan Indians right then offering sacrifices. They were not human or, or, or animal sacrifices. I think both of those are illegal there. But they were bringing vegetables and they were putting them on the fire and they were sitting around and they were chanting things because that's how they had relationship with their God. I had another experience a few years ago when I went to Hawaii and I was able to visit a very sacred place there. We, we were able to go... Uh, make contact with a, a high priest of an ancient order, uh, and he uh, actually allowed us on the property, and we walked around. I'm going to read you uh, an article about this place. It's called Hail Pilani Heao, which means a house of Pilani's temple. 
If Polynesia had its own seven wonders of the world, this ancient stone temple would be Maui's entry. Standing in front of Hawaii's largest heiau, which is a temple, five stories high, big enough to hold nearly ten football fields, it's impossible not to feel dwarfed by the scale of it all. The remote setting on a windswept coast adds to the sense of being in a sacred place. It's a step back in time without any glimpse of the modern to blemish the scene. Be still, and you can almost hear the footsteps of the ancients and summon up images of a high priest walking up the terraced stone steps to offer sacrifices to the gods. The bountiful Polynesian gardens surrounding the temple, swaying coconut palms and sturdy breadfruit trees, add even more depth to the vision of how it must have looked hundreds of years ago when this was a thriving village and home to Palani, the 16th century chief who ruled Maui. Gazing upon this engineering wonder, it's easy to understand why so many of Maui's roads near Palani's are named after him today. But as I stood there, I felt something else. As I walked up on that altar, I felt what it was like to stand on an altar where human sacrifices had been given. I felt something very different than my God. Our world is full of religion. Our world is full of people who seek spiritual things. But not everything spiritual is good. And not everything that's called God is really of God. God invites us to come know Him. But He's not going to include weird stuff like piercing your body. He's not going to include weird stuff like sleeping with, with temple prostitutes. He's not going to include weird stuff like drugs to mess you up so you could do this religion. He's not even going to be as weird, and I'm, I don't mean to be mean here again, but we have religion in this United States of America called humanism. We have religion in this United States of America called, called the New Age, where there are spirit guides, which are just uh, intellectuals who are fellowshipping with demonic spirits. That's all they are. We have gods of science. We have gods of greed. We have gods of sensuality, hedonism. But the real God, who is all-powerful, is also all-merciful. He's a God who cannot be approached, but is very approachable. He's a God that you should not be able to look at, but He bids you to come and have these Daily conversations with Him. And if you'll really push your way through, there's these places in Him that you can go to that you've never been to before. These places of intimacy. These places of strength. These places of peace. These places of power. And yet, how often do we pass by the path to His presence and instead we, we, we settle for a cup of hot chocolate or maybe some caffeine or maybe a movie or maybe a relationship that has hands and feet that you can pucker up and kiss. I was in Hawaii. I saw the natural beauty. There were 30-foot waves. It was beautiful greenish-blue water. It was, it was like a, a paradise there, but I felt, I felt the spirits of that place where human sacrifices had been given because somebody had gone the extra mile to connect with that God with their God. We have a God who comes along and He says, you know that those feelings of guilt that you have? If you'll seek My face, if you'll come and be honest with Me, if you'll tell Me you really are sorry for everything you're, you're, you've done in your life, I will, I will not only say to you I love you and I will not only say to you you're forgiven, but you're going to feel something in your spirit and, and those, that weight is going to be lifted off of you. When you're baptized in My name, you're going to come out of there feeling lighter. You're going you're to come out feeling whole and clean and complete. I'm not bidding you to come poke things into your body and walk on glass and beat yourself up and throw your baby to the alligators. I'm not asking you to go give your life to Wall Street and abort your baby because you don't have time for that baby. 
I'm calling you to an abundant life where you can have everything you're supposed to have as a healthy human being and you can walk into my presence and you can feel my love and you can look into my eyes. Is there anybody in the house who would like to have intimacy with a God like that? This is not an intimacy that you can get to by self-salvation. You cannot do enough good works to go here. But you can't get there apathetically either. It, it almost seems like a paradox. I can't work my way into this. I can't be so good that God does this. I, I can't make myself so holy that I can have this experience. On the other hand, if I don't push my way there, I won't ever get there. So it's not my works that earn it, but my efforts are the only thing that's going to help me get there because God provides the way and God provides the power, but I provide the will. There's a face-to-face -face that He wants with me. There's an eye-to-eye -eye that He wants with me, but he, he, has, he can't cheapen it. There are athletes that this morning got up earlier than you do and, and they've been, for all these times you've been eating and doing other things and coming to church, they've been working out. And they will work the rest of the day, some of them eight to ten hours a day, training for years. Some of them will train eight years to go just do one event at the Olympics. Why? Because they're driven. They want that trophy. They want that gold medallion around their neck. They want to be the best in the world. And, and they're driven to do that thing. I'll never have a gold medallion around my neck. I, I will never, I won't give the time. I wouldn't go the extra mile. I wouldn't be willing to eat like they eat. I wouldn't be willing to exercise like they exercise. I admit it. But this face-to-face -face thing with God, that appeals to me. This eye-to-eye -eye thing with God, that appeals to me. I don't deserve it. I can't imagine why he would want me there. But there's this place in him. There's this intimacy. And everything in the world is screaming at me. There, there, there are vendors that are saying, come have a relationship with me. Come in, enjoy this. Uh, uh, take your leave and come, have a vacation instead of going there. Here's a nice lodge at the foot of the mountain with a nice fireplace and some good steak dinners. Or you can take your little backpack and huff and puff your way up that place to that place with God. It's really hard to pass up that lodge. It can't be achieved by my good works, but it can't be achieved if I don't want it bad enough. It requires a purity that comes through my own will being aligned with Him and an obedience to everything He wants. It requires me to be unashamedly choosing Him every day. For those of you who came last night, and sought God in prayer. God ended last night's prayer meeting with a prophecy to us. And he, it was along these lines. He was saying, you know what? I, when you came to me, I asked you for everything. And today, I ask you for everything. It's always going to be that way. If you want to face to face with Jesus, it's got to be everything. I've said it before, and I'm not being flippant, but I'll say it again. He does not two time. He wants a wife that is pure. He wants a woman that's committed to him. He's not for this shacking up business. He's not for come try him out and then try somebody else out. He wants to know, are you committed to him? Are you willing to move in with him? Are you willing to say no to everything else? How badly do you want this relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords? Because he's just God enough to let you go serve anybody you want and do anything you want, and he's not moving. He's who he is, and he's the prize of all prizes, and he's the relationship of all relationships. He's the God of all gods, and you can either go after him or you can go be a fool. You can come to the place that he has prepared for you, or you can shake your fist all the way to a place that burns with fire and where the, where the worm dieth not and fire is not quenched. It's up to you. You can, you can rail on how mean God is to make a hell, but God's got a path up a mountain if you're willing. He, he's got a place and a relationship with Him that's wide open to you, and the only thing that keeps you from it is your own choices. Who do you want more? Alarm cock goes off for your morning prayer. Who do you want more? 
Never Never Land, where you can go sleep a little longer so you can stay up a little later and, and do something that's probably not very valuable? Or do you want to get up and talk with the King of Kings? He has play, every Sunday morning, there's a time to come worship Him. How badly do you want that? How important is that to you? I'm not going to guilt trip you. I'm just going to say, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here worshiping God. I'm going to have every, op- I'm going to take every opportunity I can to fellowship with Him. And I don't care really who does, if our culture abolishes Sundays like it almost has. There are people who have to go do a school function on Sunday because Sunday became the most open day of the week. So now our public schools are expecting us to send our kids to their event on Sunday instead of God's. Well, you choose. You want want what our public schools are getting? Do you want what our government is coming up with? How, How well is that working out? Look at our society. How well is it working out? How well is it working out for our our, our celebrities. How well is it working out for the people in our colleges who tell us how to live life? Go, go to their houses and see how their marriages are working out. Go to their, their cabinets and see what's in there to help them sleep. And ask yourself, why do I feel compelled to go do what the public school system tells me to do, but I won't keep my kid up late to go to a prayer meeting because, well, they're telling me to go do this. And God's up there saying, I'm not going to grab you by the scruff scruff of your neck and drag you up here and make you love me. You have to decide. But man, it's appealing to me that I could get away from all the junk and all the hurt and all the pain and just look into his eyes face to face. Now, this came from God himself a few months ago in a prophecy that he gave to us. I'm going to read it to you. He said, I was a man of sorrows. I was acquainted with grief. I hear your sorrows. I hear your grief. And they hid their faces from me. But I call you tonight into the future to seek my face. Seek it deeper than ever before to the point where you will see my very eyes. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You have wearied yourself by trying to be strong, but my strength will come through your weakness. I know your sorrows, I know your griefs, but I ask you to turn your face to me. The more you seek me, you will see my eyes. I invite you to gaze into my eyes so that I might direct you with my eyes. I see the very depths of your heart. I see the silent struggles that you have not even voiced to me in this prayer meeting tonight. I'm looking for you to seek my face like never before. And then you will say that I am the help of your countenance. I am the lifter of your head. They'll look to me and their faces will not be ashamed. You will run and you will not be weary. You'll walk and not faint. I am your strength. Continue to seek my very eyes. That's what he asked this church to do. I have tickets to the game. Is anybody interested? We're going to prevail and we're going to see great harvest. Is anybody interested in a night a week prayer? There's been some awesome prayer meetings. And God has has actually reached and probably the effect of some of these prayer meetings are the salvation of some souls. Did you have a part of that? Seek my face. Gaze into my eyes. This has been done before. It happened for Jacob in Genesis 32, verse 30. It says, Jacob, after he'd wrestled with the Lord all night, he'd wrestled with his own flesh. He named the place Peniel, which means face of God, for he said, I've seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The most famous example of this was Moses. And I'll just read several quick verses about him. Moses had this face-to-face relationship with God because of his his constant devotion, because of how hard he worked at it. Exodus 33, 11. Inside the tent of the meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face-to-face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of the meeting. Numbers 12, 8, 
God was disciplining Aaron and his sister who had been speaking against their pastor. And God said, I speak to him face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is, so why are you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? And then in Deuteronomy 34, and there rose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. But here's what's strange. Moses was the pastor of a congregation of millions. They watched him, an 80-year-old man, climb the mountain multiple times. There goes Pastor Moses, 80 years old. How, how, how many of you guys approaching 80 have climbed a mountain lately? How many of you approaching 50 have climbed a mountain lately? I'm sure about halfway up the mountain, he's wondering, am I crazy? But, but it was worth it to him. I've got to, I've got to go see him. If I'm going to put up with this big of a church, I've got to go get away. I've got to go talk to God. I'm going to lose my brain. I'm going to lose my mind if I don't do this. He, climbed, he had to go talk to God face to face. Otherwise, he would have been destroyed. Face to face. But he would talk to God. He's the one that saw the very finger of God right in tablets of stone. Wouldn't that be an awesome experience? Everybody here says they'd love that, but I'll guarantee you, you wouldn't climb the mountain like he climbed the mountain, most of us. How do I know that? I've been around for 50 years. I know me. My, uh, you know, I fit the laws of science. My natural tendency is to find a place of rest. To find the lowest place. Like water does. So the Israelites said, when they heard the voice of God and when they were in the presence of God, they said, Moses, Moses, it's too much for us. We want to stay down here in everyday life. We want to do the carnal stuff. We'll pay you, Moses, to be the preacher who gets up early in the morning and talks to God. We'll pay you to go spend time with the Word of God. We'll pay you to go have some very powerful experiences and then come up and, and do a speech in front of us so we can all enjoy what you did secondhand. Is that when you get to heaven, do you want to look at God and say, Glad to meet you. I never met you before, but my pastor told me about you. Can you imagine face to face? What, were, what if God were to visit this service in a special way? What if you were today in the altar time to for the first time in your life have a vision or see an angel? I was just talking with a man on the phone yesterday who said about 10 years ago he was at Winter Fire and he was with a team of people from his church. He's from Pennsylvania. And everyone in his church had meetings to attend or whatever, so he was going to the room by himself. And as he walked into the elevator and pushed the button, the door began to close and a man's hand came in and stopped the door from closing, and he stepped into the elevator. And the doors closed, and the man, he, he, never known, he never knew the man before. He wasn't even of the same race. And the man looked at him and said, you're a bishop, B-I-S-H-O-P. Now, people call me bishop, and there are some people in our movement they call bishop, but it's not a really common term. And some people don't understand it and are a little bit afraid of it even. So for a per perfect stranger just to look at you and say you're a bishop is kind of like to take you back. And he, it was kind of different for him. And, and then the, the guy began to tell him about how they had just uh, done some, changed the name of their church and, how, and, and, and it became very obvious that this, this was just no ordinary guy. He began to tell him some of the things that were going to happen in the next little while. He said, I saw you from across the the hotel lobby the other day and I couldn't get to you so I decided to stay an extra day to talk to you and this man was so overwhelmed by everything that was said and he was he was so uh, caught up in the experience that he didn't really find out anything else and he doesn't even know who the guy was he thinks he was an angel at the very least it was someone God sent 
out of nowhere just to speak a word into his life. You want that kind of experience? Or do you want to just hire someone to come tell us a story that they had that experience? What do I want? When thou saidest to Acts 2 ministries, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, maybe in 2016, because I have to finish my degree, maybe when I get my family situated here, and my, I have a couple health issues, and when I get those taken care of, then I'll probably seek your face. Got a lot of job responsibility, and you know you, it's, it's just irresponsible not to give your employer the best. Can you imagine how hollow that sounds to God? You're running around trying to make your employer happy. You're running around trying to make your family happy, trying to save your family, trying to minister to your family. And the God of gods who could in a heartbeat do thousands times better than you could ever do for your family is waiting for you just to come, maybe give him a token worship for the week. When thou saidest, seek my face, I said, maybe once a month. When you who died for me, when you who went out all out of your way to get me to a place where at least I, I've heard the truth, I've sat and watched miracles happen. I've had people stand in front of me. I've seen people call people out. I just know you're real. You've demonstrated to me how powerful you are. And, and I've had experiences already with you that are so special. But you know what? I'm kind of like Brother Hanson Red Sox game. He only needs to look at an article about it every four or five years to know they're still there. But he's not going to go across the street to shake hands with or, or get a baseball signed by one of them. That's how I feel about you, God. I know you're powerful and I, I know you're up there, but you know, I've got shows to watch and I've got relationships to pursue. <clears throat> I don't even really know if it's possible. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 from the message a paraphrase says, Whenever though they turn to face God as Moses did, God removes the veil and there they are face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is a living personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it. All of us, nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of His face, and so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become more like Him. Does anybody want anything like that in their life? Do we really want this harvest when we talk about God changing New England? Is it, is it just something we kind of root for? Like, yeah, let's do that thing, Pastor, and then, yeah, let's change New England, but I can't really give up a Saturday to go pass out a few flyers because Aunt Matilda's in town, and I haven't seen her in like two weeks. God's saying, when I said, seek my face, and look into my eyes. I gave you an opportunity that I don't just give everybody. And you said, now some people may object, and this is where God used Brother, Brother Biscuit today to help me. You may say, well, it's too much about feelings. I'm not the emotional type. And I understand that sentiment. I understand that we shouldn't just let pure feelings take us away to do strange stuff. We shouldn't, we shouldn't allow an emotion to override good sense. But I'm talking about understanding good sense and then letting your emotions come along. If you're face to face with God, don't you think there's going to be a few emotions with that? If you were guilty and you're no longer guilty, don't you think there's going to be a few emotions about Isn't that what all the movies are about when there's a courtroom scene and finally they say not guilty and there's tears and everyone's shouting and patting everybody on the back and congratulating everybody? There's great emotion that flows out of that. 
He saved your hide. He pulled you from the flames. And you're going to tell me that it would be out of order to be too emotional about that? Our, our emotions and our senses are supposed to be our slaves. They're supposed to serve us. Now, food is about nutrition, right? If you've ever been in the hospital and they fed you through IV, you'll be the first to testify that's not satisfying. Food tastes. It, it, you touch it. It feels warm or gooey or crispy or crunchy. or You, you experience food. It's, how would you feel if the food... Uh, just got stuck in your stomach and you were taken care of, you, you never had... I mean, what would it be like if our lives did not include food? I could make the case. But well, you're going to get all emotional about food? You're going to say, oh, I love pizza. Oh. Isn't that a little emotional? That's who we are. Romantic relationships are a wonderful f part of our life. Why? Because our, em our emotions get to experience them. They're not wonderful because they're in a book somewhere. A loves B, and that's all there is to it. That's not why two people get married. M maybe I could liken it to this. It's, it's getting to know God is a whole lot like maybe a blind person Warming themselves by the fire. They don't see it, but they can feel it. They could position themselves and they, could, they know when it's too close and they can just get comfortable. They don't have to see it. Uh, they could even be deaf and blind. The fire would be real. It would still do everything it could. We are limited in knowing God and that we don't physically see Him. So the only way we can know Him is to sense Him in other ways. And if the enemy can talk you out of using the other ways... Strange enough, he'll use those to get you to do his thing, but then he tells you to shut him off when it comes to God. Why do people do heroin? Do they shut their emotions off? Do they shut feelings off? Why do people uh, commit adultery? Is it an emotionless act that they do? do they not, are they not emotional about the whole thing? No. The enemy knows we're human beings, and he appeals to our senses until we get to church. And then he says, you're not supposed to be emotional. Spiritual lobot lobotomy. Takes his ice pick and just... God's saying, you know, he's a punk. And I'll kick him in the teeth for you if you want. But if you don't want to come see me face to face, he's going to lobotomize you. You're going to be, you're going to be able to sit through moves of God and not shed a tear. You're going to be able to walk. You, you, when you walk down to this altar, you're going to have to push past angels to get down there and pretend. You'll stand right amongst people that are being healed, but no, you're not interested, so you won't be healed. You won't be touched. And that night, some, somebody who hasn't even done anything good for me, somebody who's come out of a life of sin, somebody who's never even lived righteousness yet they're gonna they're gonna get woken up in the middle of the night and they're gonna believe that i'm real and they're gonna stumble out of their bed and they're gonna start talking to me and they're gonna look right in my eyes well your volume is keeping you asleep because it's the only way you could go to bed god is real he doesn't call us to a religion like the Hindus or the Islamic or the, the New Age. He calls us to a relationship. He, he, the creator of the universe, He invites us to come interface with Him through our senses. And we feel after Him. We hear His voice. And we feel His Spirit. And He talks to us through our spiritual ears. And when we obey His Word we are following the instruction manual. We're following our GPS system up the path. And if we'll go far enough up the path, there's going to be some face-to-face -face experiences with Him. 
If you wanted to meet the governor of our state today, there's some protocol. You're not just going to waltz into the governor's mansion and, you know, push past the people that are standing there and go sit down at the breakfast table with the governor. You're going to have to make an appointment. You're probably going to even have to dress up a little bit. Maybe even almost as much as you dress up for church. You're going to have to go where he's at. You're going to have to travel to Hartford or wherever he's at right now. You're going to have to go to the... You might not even be allowed in. There's protocol. And there's protocol with our, our Almighty God. You know the reason He asks everyone in this room to repent? It's because He's holy. He's not looking down on you. He's just not, he's not living in the world you're living in. He's living in a clean environment. And if you want to come into His environment, you, you, you have to do like people who are, are walking into the rooms where they make chips for computers. They have to put on white suits. They have to wash their hands. and They have to be cleaner than the hospital personnel have to be because they're going into a, a clean environment. And God's just saying, I love you, and I have the white uniform for you to put on, and I have the soap for you to wash up with. I have an altar for you to repent at. I have a place for you to be baptized in my name, and I'll even come live inside of you and give you the power to do this, but you've got to want to. If you don't want to, I can't help you. I'm offering you a face-to-face. -face. Some of you have made no, you may have noticed in the last little while, maybe I'm just getting old, but etiquette is slipping. People don't say thank you and please or sir or ma'am or hold doors or uh, even like recently my wife sent out some invitations uh, to an event and uh, she sent out 67 of them and she's only received 12 replies. Because most people, they don't realize that it's kind of rude not to reply if someone invites you someplace. And our society just blows it off. So if we're not careful, we let that slip into church and we say, oh, God understands. He's a loving God. He understands. Yeah, God understands. You don't. Who do you think you are? Deciding when and where you're going to talk to the creator of the universe. Who do you think you are blowing it off like you can do this next week? You're not promised next week. You're not promised tomorrow. This face, I'm trying to tell you, it's, he's a loving God. He's offering you a face to face. But for you to walk past it is no small thing. And you might do it dozens of times. But there'll come a day when. That path will be so overgrown you won't even recognize it anymore. And you'll, you'll be looking around, where is God? Face to face. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, athletes give their life for trophies, as I said. Politicians sell their souls for power. People will ruin their families and their health for money. And in pursuit of a feeling, they'll kill brain cells and they'll, in an effort to have a euphoric experience, they'll kill other human beings just to get enough money to go have that euphoric experience. Uh, don't tell me that we don't have the will. Don't tell me that we don't have the, the get up and go. We need to pursue Him like we pursue our job. We need to pursue Him like we pursue our doctor. Have you canceled as many appointments with your doctor as you have with church in the last year? Oh, He'll understand. God Himself says, angels, get ready. I want to heal some people down there at 10 o'clock at Acts 2 Ministries next week. God gets a whole band of angels ready. He's ready to minister. He talks to different people, so much so that four or five people who've not even talked about the service get up and say the very same thing. God orchestrating. God trying to do something with mankind. God saying, I'm ready to have a face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> I wake up trying to decide if I have a sniffle and if it's enough to keep me from that relationship. We need to pursue Him like we pursue the rays at work. We need to pursue Him like we do a boyfriend or a girlfriend when we're really desperate. We need to pursue Him like we do a good time. 
People will do anything to have a good time nowadays. They'll drive 30 minutes, an hour, two hours to go to a party on Friday night. They'll stay up till 2 in the morning if they have some friends to go have dinner with. I've talked to them. You and I have done that. Sorry, I didn't make prayer meeting because I had this thing that went to what? Well, that tells me something. Stay up till 2 because you want to have this party but can't make 9.30 prayer because you had to brush your teeth twice. Boy, I told God I'd say anything He wanted, so sorry if I'm making you mad. I'm just telling you, He's ready for a face-to-face. He is hungry for some people but we, we, he has to get us to stop making our excuses because if you wanted to bad enough, you've done other things. You, you've, there's people in this room who have gone the extra mile. You've stayed up late. You've pushed the envelope. You've done all kinds of stuff when you wanted it bad enough. And, and the King of Kings is saying, I'm about to come back. If you don't believe me, just look at the Middle East and just look at it. ISIS is now in 10, 15 nations and how it's, it's, it's now overcoming the world and and the politicians even in the freest country in the world don't have enough sense they don't even want to confront this evil it's a picture of our lives today some of us know we're doing things wrong but we don't even have the energy to fight it we know it could kill us but we're not even ready and until they're they're cutting our heads off in our streets we're not sure if isis is a problem god's up there saying look it's all it's, it's all turning out just like I said. Didn't I say it, all the world would turn against Israel? Didn't I say that in my word? Didn't I say they'd all come together against Israel? Isn't it happening right there? <sighs> I noticed that in the news. You know, but you know, I've got a lot going on, and I know they got prayer meetings going on at the church, and I know that God's wanting to save the whole world, but if I don't take this job promotion that has me working 85 hours a week, what about my retirement? Your retirement? You think there'll be a nice place to retire in 20 years if it keeps going like it's going? And the Lord's saying, how about some face-to-faces? It's getting perilous times. It's getting dark. It's getting horrible. But I'm a loving God. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to force you and I'm not going to be mean to you, but I'm going to tell you like it is. There's this place in me that you can have. There's this face-to-face that you can have. In fact, there's this eye-to-eye that you can have. I'm just wondering who's interested in that. Would you stand? Now, I know... Sometimes we're just afraid. <clears throat> I told the story before, and as you gather in the altar, I want to tell it again. In 1998, <clears throat> my wife and I were at a, a minister's retreat, <clears throat> just like the one we're going to go to this week. <clears throat> it's where all the ministers and wives from the district are invited to a three-day event where we, we pray and we fellowship and we hear teaching. And <clears throat> God had been doing some amazing things in Acts 2 Ministries back at the time and been really building our faith. And uh, In fact, there had been multiple people who had actually had experiences of seeing angels, some of them for the first time in their lives. Why? Because the whole church was like gung-ho, let's seek His face kind of thing. And God spoke to my wife and I and and told us that He was going to use us in the district to speak revival, to loose revival, that we were ordained to speak and loose revival. And it's like, I wasn't even a... I was the secretary of the home missions. So there was a department head and I was the secretary. That's the only role I had in the district at that point. And God told me that I was going to speak into the district and loose revival. That was kind of hard to believe because I was just a nobody at the conference. Then he told us that he was going to, uh, that, that we were going to have an angelic visitation that night. Well, my wife and I went to bed and we couldn't go to sleep. Kept opening our eyes and looking around and kept, you know, and probably some, a little bit of imagination. But there was great expectation there. And, and partway through the night, <clears throat> 
there was uh, there was a time when uh, we felt we saw like um, a form of light or something like that. Just just something that could be. We didn't know if we were imagining things at that point or whatever. And, and we thought maybe something was going to happen. Eventually, we went to sleep and we never did see anything. And when we got up in the morning, disappointed and talked to God about that, he he gave us some understanding. He said, I, I did manifest something to you, but you were disappointed just like the ministers in this district have been disappointed because they've been believing for these supernatural things for so many years and they haven't seen them and they haven't seen them and they haven't seen them. And now they're afraid to believe it's going to happen. Some of you, God has invited you to see His face before and you haven't ever really experienced what you thought you would, so your brain is telling you, don't go there again. Be disappointed. So I want to challenge you not to go where you imagine, but just to write God a blank check and say, I don't know what this will be like. I don't know what it will look like. I don't know what it will feel like. I'm not seeking any particular kind of experience. I'm not trying to, to have any specific things happen to me. I just want what you said. I want to look into your eyes. And instead of being euphoric, I might be scared to death. I don't know. But I want to look into your eyes. I want to climb this mountain. I want to push into your presence. I want to go here. That's your choice. So I'm going to read Psalm 27 from the, ba the Bible in basic English. And as I do, I'd like you just to close your eyes and listen and see if you can agree with the psalmist. And when I'm done reading, I won't do any comments. I'm just going to read. I like my wife to play. And when I'm done, I'm basically going to, to say the path is before you. Do what you want to do. But God told us we could look into his eyes. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who is then a cause of fear to me? The Lord is the strength of my life. Who is a danger to me? When evildoers, even my haters, come on me to put an end to me, they were broken and put to shame. Even if an army came up against me with its tents, my heart would not fear. If war was made on me, my faith would not be moved. One prayer have I made to the Lord, and this is my heart's desire that I might have a place in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, looking on His glory and getting wisdom in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He will keep me safe in His tent. In the secret place of His tent, He will keep me from men's eyes. High on a rock He will put me, and now my head will be lifted up higher than my, and my haters who are round about me. Because of this, I will make offerings of joy in His tent. I will make a song. Truly, I will make a song of praise to the Lord. O oh Lord, let the voice of my cry come to your ears. Have mercy on me and give me an answer. When you said, make search for my face, my heart said to you, for your face will I make my search. Let not your face be covered from me. Do not put away your servant in wrath. You have been my help. Do not give me up or take your support from me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother are turned away from me, then the Lord will be my support. Make your way clear to me, O Lord, guiding me by the right way because of my haters. Do not give me into their hands because false witnesses have come out against me and men breathing destruction. I had almost given up my hope of seeing the blessing of the Lord in the land of the living. Let your hope be in the Lord. Take heart and be strong. Yes, let your hope be in the Lord. Oh God. Not tomorrow, right now. Do you want to seek Him?